Very good morning to all of you. May I request Professor Devendra Singh to start with today's session? Uh, good morning, everybody. So today we are going to have a, a webinar on a very, very interesting topic that is uh, complex origin of complexity and complexity of origin. A very uh, like uh, a topic which everybody thinks about uh, that uh, we should have knowledge about this thing. And even Darwin, who gave his theory about uh, evolution, theory of natural selection, he was not very sure about uh, the origin of uh, complexity. So Darwin was uh, ready with his theory when he was only 30 years old. And he worked for 20 years to collect evidence in support of origin of complexity. And still, he could not collect much evidence and he had to publish his theory because others like Wallace, they were ready with similar type of theory. So he published his theory in 1859 without uh, uh, being able to explain origin of complexity in higher organisms. Particularly, he mentioned uh, that uh, if we talk about the origin of the eye, from very precursor primitive eye, he wrote, like I quote him, I freely express that this approach of understanding origin through natural selection seems absurd in the highest possible degree. He was not very clear about this, uh, how origin of complexity can take place. So if you go through literature, uh, last month in May uh, 2020, a very interesting paper was published by Pile et al. in Nature Journal, uh, Origin of Complexity in Hemoglobin. And they provided the molecular evidence for the origin of complexity. And that is probably the best explanation for origin of complexity uh, as uh, we discuss it in the evolution or uh, in the theory of nature selection. So to explain these things to our students, we requested Dr. Bhatt from Indian Institute of Science to uh, share his ideas, share his views with our students. So he has accepted our request and today he'll be speaking on this topic. And before we start, actually start the topic, I'll request Dr. Bharti to introduce Dr. Bhatt to the audience. Dr. Bharti, please. Uh, thank you. That, uh... I am delighted to introduce today's guest, Dr. Ram Rebhat. Dr. Ram Rebhat, as stated by Professor Devendra Singh, is currently based at Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. His research in interests include cancer biology, developmental biology, and evolutionary biology. And interestingly, he earned the degree of MBBS from University of Kolkata and PhD from New York Medical College, and has been postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, USA. Ramre is an intermediate fellow, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance, and DST Sub Earlier Career Research Fellow. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ramre Bhatt for today's talk. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Bhatt. Thank you so much. Thank you for a very nice introduction, as well as for a very um, um, informative exposition of uh, on the origin of complexity. Um, I can only, it only would help me build on uh, what I mean to speak on further. Uh, so would you want me now to share my screen? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so I will do that. Um, all right. So is my first slide visible uh, to you, professors? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, all right. Let me just... Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's visible. Now it's visible, right? Yes. yes. Um, uh, is the video playing? I just wanted to confirm this. Uh, yeah, it's playing. It's, it's working. I'll, I'll get yeah. started. Um, so, um, um, you know, thank you once again uh, for, for inviting me to uh, present in this uh, series of very exalted speakers. I see uh, both preceding as well as following me. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a little fitting, uh, perhaps, to talk, um, uh, you know, flanked by uh, John Strassman and, uh, and as well as Trevor Price before me, um, uh, given the fact that we are talking on, on evolution and, 
um, and I would like to sort of squeeze in development somewhere there. Uh, so um, uh, the, the the modification, uh, you know, as of course we speak uh, uh, to the title uh, for uh, in the presentation would be uh, that I would introduce a, uh, the term morphology. Um, perhaps uh, a disappointment to some who wanted to think about other origins and other complexities. But you know, I, I label myself as a in, in an old-fashioned way as a as a morphologist. So. Um, I would, um, when I speak about complexity, I would speak about morphological complexity. Uh, Professor Singh's, um, uh, along the lines of what Professor Singh, uh, Singh spoke about uh, in terms of the eye. And when I talk about the, the origins, I would also speak about um, the origin of form, uh, mostly in my talk. Um, and so um, the, uh, in the background, of being, um, a, a ball of cells, which uh, sort of moved uh, into uh, the surrounding three-dimensional space, which consists of uh, what is called the extracellular matrix. So this is how you know you have a three-dimensional structure uh, growing in, um, and 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 dividing and and proliferating and moving into and occupying spaces within the body. Um, so uh, when I speak about origins of morphological complexity and complexity of morphological origins, uh, the topic kind of transforms and the title uh, transforms from being merely uh, provocative uh, into um, a term that is somewhat familiar to uh, practitioners of this science, uh, and it's known as uh, Evo Devo or uh, evolutionary developmental biology. So, um, origins, uh, you know, origins of uh, morphology um, concern, of course, ev evolutionists concern themselves with the origins of morphology and developmental biologists or embryologists are concerned with understanding how morphological complexity comes about. So I'm in some sense, uh, you know, uh, less fancifully uh, speaking about um, evolutionary developmental biology. So what is uh, Evo Devo, evolutionary developmental biology? Um, so Evo Devo concerns itself, or it begins with its uh, with with the observation uh, that form or phenotype, as we call it, phenotype of course being a larger um, uh, sort of umbrella covering form, but including other things such as behavior as well. But form um, changes along typically along two temporal scales or two time scales. Uh, one is the developmental time scale. Uh, and the other one uh, is the evolutionary time scale. So developmental time scale is along the life history of an organism, uh, form keeps changing and uh, along several generations and long you know, iterative life histories, uh, you have from also undergoing a transformation uh, and that's your evolutionary time scale. Uh, so, uh, so Evo Devo begins by asking kind of the, a, a very tough question, which is somewhat unresolved as of now. Uh, which is that do the changes that occur on the developmental time scale within the life history of an organism, do these changes regulate in turn, do they influence uh, the time scale of the evolution, the, the dynamics of change of form that occur on the evolutionary time scale? So does the, de does the development of an individual or a, in, of an organism also influence how the organism or its, you know, or the population or consisting of those organisms evolve? Before asking such a difficult question, and as I said, it's, it's uh, as yet not very, uh, very clear and we don't have clear answers to it. Uh, let us step back and ask a slightly more simpler question. Do we really know even how form changes along the developmental time scale? Because if we understand that, we might then use that to then ask the, 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 the earlier question. So do we know uh, the first principles that guide, for example, how organismal development occurs? So uh, one way of uh, understanding how development happens is to understand or to define development in various ways. And one of one particular way of defining development uh, or interpreting development by development, again, I mean uh, the, the changes that occur in the body or form of an organism over its life history is, to, is, is that it is basically a series of pattern transformations. So what do I mean by pattern? What do I mean by transformations? So we'll go to the next slide. So uh, by pattern, I typically mean uh, the arrangement of cells uh, in a spatial and temporal manner, again, in space and time. So um, how cells change, start changing their arrangement vis-a-vis -vis each other um, in space and over the time, the life history of the organism is what is in some sense development, along with, of course, a bunch of other terms added in, such as differentiation, morphogenesis, and so on. Uh, 
but if one then starts looking at how this pattern changes from one time point to second time point to the third time and so on, one then understands that it is a series of transformations that are occurring. Uh, these transformations, as I will refer to later, uh, don't stop once the embryo is born or once the conceptus comes out. Uh, the, the, these transformations continue even later on, and we will get to that in some time. So these transformations are responsible also for how an embryo with, at a stage where all the cells are homogeneous with respect to each other, transforms into an embryo where you now have specific cells that are determ determined to give rise to specific tissues. It also is, a, the pattern transformation also defines how a particular tissue A differs from a tissue B. In the sense that the patterns that eventually end up, the end endpoint patterns, which are also known as homeostatic patterns of say the liver are very different from say that, that of the kidney or say that of the limb is very different from how the spleen is arranged. So these are known as tissue architectures or, and they are hence tissue specific. So architectures of organs are very different from each other. And it's those architectures that give rise to the structure and the function and specify how the structure and function of one organ differs from that of the other organ. So that is the importance of pattern formation, the importance of pattern transformation to give rise to symmetry breaking, to make each part of the body separate from the other part of the body. And that is development in some sense. So how do these pattern transformations take place? How do, how do patterns change? How do cell cellular rearrangements occur? And how are they how are they conserved across life history such that the way the liver forms and differently from the kidney in one organism uh, is, is similar to that of the same, is another organism of the same species? How is it different across species and so on? To understand that, uh, one of the approaches that have been taken, uh, which, is, uh, which was largely motivated by the molecular biology revolution of the previous century, uh, looks, upon, um, looks upon development looks upon uh, the developmental program as some sort of a computation of the genome. It looks at the fact that you have a bunch of genes which are connected to each other through very intricate networks, such as uh, that pointed in, uh, in, in, uh, in the slide. Uh, by the way, is, uh, are you able to see my uh, arrow as it moves across the screen? Yes, yes. yes. Excellent. So you can see, for example, uh, so this is this this uh, sort of school of thought was largely um, motivated by uh, Professor Eric Davidson of uh, Caltech, along with Britain, uh, if I'm not mistaken, through a very influential um, uh, piece in the 1960s, uh, which spoke about which which was the precursor to the ideas of uh, the gene regulatory networks and the idea that you know each each tissue or each uh, the, the way tissues are specified and axes are specified within uh, organismal during organism organismal development occur uh, through symmetry breaking in these deployment of these gene regulated networks um, and 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 that is what makes things different so one of the ways by which we can try and understand how pattern transformation takes place uh, is by looking at the differences between the gene regulatory networks that underlie one organ versus the other, one tissue versus the other. The other uh, school of thought, or the other approach um, was taken uh, um, by my supervisor, PhD supervisor, Professor Stuart Newman, and along with me in the late uh, 2000s, uh, when we came up with a framework uh, called the Dynamical Patterning Modules Framework. And that framework sought to understand the similarities between how things form rather than the dissimilarities between how different tissues form. So we try to understand whether there are first principles to how development can occur, how pattern formation occurs. Um, and we were able to assign uh, discrete and distinct physicochemical functions to specific molecules uh, that are heavily involved in development. And uh, we were able to uh, see whether these physicochemical principles can come together either individually or in combination with each other to give rise to specific morphogenetic outcomes. Let me, for example, if you look at the, the table out here, the first dynamical patterning module, uh, we call the ADH. The ADH is, uh, stands for adhesion. The physics is that of adhesion. So when deployed, 
through any cell adhesion molecule. So here, the identity of the molecule is not important, but its function or its role is important. Uh, so it could be coherence, as I mentioned here. It could be the cell adhesion molecules, the NCAMs, the ECAMs. It could be galactins. It could be a bunch of molecules that are generally present, which are able to mediate adhesion between cells. So the moment you have the deployment of this particular DPM, all of a sudden, instead of having a bunch of cells that are present next to each other, now you have all of them connected together to form a collective mass or an adherent cluster. So how does cluster formation take place? Cluster formation takes place through the deployment of this particular uh, dynamical patterning module. You can also have other such modules come in, which give rise to slightly more and more complex pattern formation. So as you can see, if you look at the image on the right hand side of, of how the transformations are taking place, you would see that specific rearrangements are occurring. And it's these rearrangements that are brought about by the deployment of these dynamical patterning modules. This is a crucial point because this will, this will sort of the, the echoes of this particular table uh, will hold forth throughout my talk. Because what we will try to do is we will try to use this particular table and we'll try to use this particular conceptual framework to ask questions of whether we can interpret development using such a table, using such a conceptual framework of dynamical patterning modules. So can we understand development through them? And if we can understand development through this particular conceptual framework, can we understand evolution through these such a framework as well? Okay. And I'll, to, for that, I will come towards, towards, I'll come to the evolutionary aspects towards the end of my talk. So the first case I will talk about is that of limb development, one of the most classical uh, forms of, um, rather one of the most classical exemplars uh, of developmental biology, something that has been looked on since ever. As to how limbs develop, what are the developmental features uh, that are involved during the embryogenesis of the limb and how the limb patterning occurs. So stripped down to its extreme basics, limb development uh, can be looked upon as a development of the skeleton inside the limb, the musculature and so on form later on. And the way the skeleton of the limb forms can again be understood as a series of what are called condensations that occur within the limb. These condensations are basically collections of cells that come together at specific places separated from each other and they go on to form the cartilage elements, which ultimately will be will give rise to the bone uh, that are part of the limb. Okay, so again, limb development. Now coming to interpreting it along the axis of pattern formation, limb development and the, or the and, and or the development of the limb skeleton can be interpreted as the development of of a particular pattern of spot-like structures which are all going to be the elements of the skeleton, which occur spaced apart and sized similarly. So it is again a pattern that forms of spots of collections, cellular collectives, which will give rise to elements. Now, the way spot-like patterns or rod-like patterns or these kind of iterative patterns form can again has been, has been theorized by a lot of different um, um, workers um, I mean, uh, among the among the more uh, most famous ones is of course Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing, a mathematician, a British mathematician, uh, wrote a very influential paper uh, in the 1950s uh, called "The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis," I believe, uh, where he spoke about the fact that you can actually have uh, a, if you have only as less as two uh, chemicals which are able to react with each each other, interact with each other along specific rules, as well as can diffuse in space, um, you can actually start getting spot-like or iterative patterns of their concentrations in space simultaneously and immediately. Uh, so uh, one of the ways by which such, a, such kind of iterative patterns have been studied is through trying to understand whether such kind of molecular couples, activators and inhibitors, um, or Turing-like uh, morphogens uh, are involved in giving rise to such patterns. And people uh, who have been start trying to understand whether there are these activators and inhibitors, uh, diffusible activators and inhibitors of spot-like patterning within the limb field as well. Uh, so in 2007, uh, we uh, came across uh, a bunch of, uh, a family of proteins known as galactins. Now these proteins 
are known to be uh, sugar binding proteins. They bind to specific sugars uh, called galactose, which are present on the cell surface. Uh, these proteins are also known to diffuse. Uh, so given the fact that they were diffusive and they were able to bind to uh, proteins on the surface of cells, which is an important aspect for bringing together the clustering. Remember the clustering, uh, the first DPM. So we asked whether these proteins are also involved in the pattern formation of limb development. Our experiments subsequently showed that there were two of these proteins called galactin 1 and 8. The identities are not very important, but uh, for the sake of accuracy. Galactin 1 acted as an activator. So you can see a limb, a chick limb in the middle. And if you add more and more of galactin 1, you go to a certain site, which is you start getting extra digits, start getting extra pattern where you when if you decrease the galactin one, you go to the left hand side, which is the absence of digit. Similarly, galactin eight, if you start negating galactin eight, you again go to the right. And if you start adding galactin eight, you go to the left. In other words, galactin one and galactin eight seem to us to act like putative activators and inhibitors. Remember, these are also diffusive molecules. So they were performing or they were conforming to a few of the essential rules that Turing had um, uh, propounded were essential to give rise to pattern formation. So then we asked uh, further on, we did a series of experiments, whereas we were able to show that indeed the, the interaction between galactin 1 and galactin 8 uh, was able to give rise to these kind of digit, digital patterns. And this was a, a particular framework within which we could ask whether the interactions are sufficient to give rise to patterns. To understand sufficiency of mechanisms rather than um, um, going for an experimental approach, one can also take a modeling approach where one starts putting together the interactions of different molecules uh, into a mathematical model and ask whether are these interactions able to give rise to patterns. So this breaks it down uh, the, to, to the, the basic minimum set of interactions and asks whether those interactions can are required, they are necessary and sufficient to give rise to pattern. Uh, in the mathematical model performed um, uh, in collaboration with uh, my long-term friend, uh, Tillman Glim at the Western Washington University, we found no, the interactions were not sufficient. There was something missing and that missing aspect so Turing's model is known as a reaction diffusion model. You have a reaction between the activator and inhibitor. You also have diffusion of the activator inhibitor. But there was one extra element missing. And that extra element is adhesion. Adhesion, which otherwise Turing had not, had not talked about in terms of having being relevant to the, to, to the pattern formation. In this case, at least in the computer model, seemed to be playing a vital role in giving rise to the patterning. It was actually influencing the pattern. So if this were to hold true though, there was one rider. The cell adhesion as component, as you can see on the right, on the left hand side top of the equation, the cell adhesion combined with the diffusion and the interaction could give rise to the pattern in the computer model if and only if the cells are moving. Why is it important for the cells to move? Turing reaction diffusion models or Turing pattern formation models have generally assumed that the cells form a field which is static and agnostic the molecular dynamics that take place. The molecular dynamics are the molecules, the activators, the inhibitors. The activators and inhibitors form a pattern by diffusing and interacting with each other. And they give rise to spot-like patterns. And the cells which are in those spots react. So the cells lie downstream to the molecular network. However, here, what we, what we, our model was telling us is that the cells are actually active players of the pattern formation. So this is the difference between this can be brought through, through, um, through an analogy. So it is like, if I'm trying to put across a, a map of countries, one thing would be that I would draw my latitudes and longitudes which are my molecules, and I would put the countries in their place according to those, according to that map. Okay. Here, the idea was the maps themselves are drawing the latitudes and longitudes while they are fitting together in the map. So the, the map is disconnected 
generally from the construction of the map. In this case, the map and the construction of the map are occurring simultaneously. Such kind of processes are called morphodynamic processes rather than morphostatic processes, where the map, the chemical map, and the morphogenesis that occurs, the morphogenesis occurs downstream of the map. In this case, these processes are occurring simultaneously. So we asked, so this led the model to let, let us go into the experiments and ask, indeed, are the cells moving? And this led to doing time-lapse micrography, time-lapse fluorescent microscopy of limb cells as they are coming together to form the condensations. So when we do, did that using fluorescent markers against the histones, you would see in the video that over time, the cells are can be traced to be moving and not just do they move, they eventually come together to form these spot-like patterns. So the spot is, the video is playing in a loop. So you would see that the, the cells move over wide distances and they go on to form the map. So indeed, our model was allow, allowed us to predict an experiment to test it and to, you know, to prove or disprove the hypothesis that indeed limb development uh, could be interpreted as a morphodynamic process. Coming to the evolutionary aspects, now that we had a molecular framework, a galactin-1, a galactin-8, which is acting to get to a pattern, one can then ask the question, uh, can, can did this molecular network, this network of proteins, give rise not just to the limb in case of the chickens, which we were working with, but can it also explain the variation in the limb patterns for other animals? Can it, for example, explain one, when one can have a, a, a plethora of limbs skeletons, and so on. So to understand that, we used a phylogenetic approach to look at galactin 1 and 8 and look at its, its, its orthologs along evolutionary history. We were able to find that galactin 8 was under a very active selection, positive selection within fishes. Why is, is that important? It is important because limbs are thought to be evolutionarily distinct from fins. And the fin limb transition is a very important transition that occurs in the history of animals, with limbed animals being called tetrapods and everything before it being called actinopterygians. Now, if one were to look at the, the, the elements that form within the, the skeletal elements that form within the fins, which is on the right hand side, the actinopterygians, and one looks at the the sarcopterygians, which are which include the tetrapods, one would see that there has been definitely a decrease in the element number generally that has happened in case of tetrapods. Whereas in, in case of actinopterygians, there is a huge a degree of variety as well as higher number of elements in general. So we asked, can our model, can our network actually explain, can the evolution, possible evolution work explain how one can have an increase or decrease in the number of digits. To do so, we again went back to our mathematical model and we looked at how much, how, how what is the nature of patterns that we get in our computer model when we, were, when we are to alter the two, two particular um, aspects of galactin 8, which we saw was actively uh, evolving, at least in the fishes. We saw that the gene expression rate of galactin 8 uh, as well as the binding affinity of galactin 8, if these two parameters were to be varied and weighted differently with respect to each other, one can actually get a large number of digits when the expression rate and the binding affinities are small, and one can actually get lower and lower, progressively lower number of elements, skeletal elements, if one were to go higher. Now, the galactin binding affinity in general is very weak in, in, um, in, in case of uh, sugar proteins or sugar binding proteins. So uh, more than the x-axis, along the y-axis, if we look at the expression rate or the change in expression rate of galactin 8, one can actually understand that this may have brought about a change in the element number between fishes versus, um, versus tetrapods. Interestingly, uh, we did find a particular uh, conserved non-coding element, which is present in the upstream near promoter region of significantly only the tetrapods and which, which is absent in case of the actinopterygians, along with a bunch of other interesting evolutionary changes that occurred between these two. But this could certainly explain, this conserved non-coding element could explain how the expression rate could be regulated 
in the sarcopter region, in the tetrapod galactinate, being able to bring its uh, expressions to a level where the, you would start getting a progressively lower number of elements. Interestingly, this conserved element, which is present only in, in the sarcopter regions, also had putative uh, binding uh, sites for elements such as RUNCS1, RUNCS2, MICE, TCF, CP121, which are all transcription factors that are implicated in various aspects of limb development. So uh, with that, I would move to um, um, a second uh, sort of paradigm. Uh, how are we doing on time, uh, Professor Bhati? Yeah, there's no issue. You can continue. Lovely. So I can yeah. move to uh, the which, which I was referring to in case of uh, moving beyond development, moving to elements, moving to uh, morphogenesis in the postnatal stage. So if one can think of patterns, one can think of pattern transformations uh, and transformations ultimately give rise to the architecture of the organs as they perform in an adult organism. Uh, these patterns eventually are responsible for how the, or the, the particular organ is shaped and is functioning in the adults. So on the left hand side out here, you would see uh, this round shaped structure. This is basically, these are, these are uh, breast epithelial cells, which have been cultured again in three dimensions, where uh, they, in, given the right kind of micro environmental cues, they are able to adopt such kind of structures, which are called asini like structures. Asini are breast structures that you would also see in the breast organ in vivo. Now, this structure comes about through an interaction of the stable genome of the cells. No doubt the genotype plays an important role, but it's also shaped, as you will see in subsequently, by the cues of both the micro environment, by which I mean the environment within the body, as well as the macro environment, which is present outside the body. Now, if one thinks of this the what happens in disease, you basically start departing from this homeostatic structure and you start losing the architecture. Remember the term I mentioned, tissue architecture, or organ architecture. This organ architecture is lost in diseases such as in cancer. What is cancer? Well, if you would just look at the, the slide again, you would see on the right hand side is, is the same breast epithelial cells, which have now gotten transformed and are showing this branched-like structure. The first size, of course, where they fill up the, the internal hollowness, and then they start doing this branching-like process. This is the outcome of an unstable genome. It is also the product of the unstable genome, the transformed genome that is interacting with the microenvironment of the body, as well as with the macroenvironment, and hence the environmental causes of cancer and so on. So, the question again begins, is this a chaotic process? Is this a process of disorganization? Or can we now, using our pattern transformation idea, also think about cancer as another case of pattern transformation? Are there specific rules that guide how a particular pattern structure came about through pattern patterning rules, as we described it in using the DPMs, can the same DPM framework be also deployed now to understand how a pattern structure becomes a differently patterned structure, such as in case of the cancer? So is there, are there, again, first principles to carcinogenesis? Are there first principles to how the form changes in cancer and how it changes in metastasis and so on? These are what I have been thinking about. And my group has been uh, trying to work on. Uh, since 2015 um, in the Indian Institute of Science. And we use both breast as well as ovaries as uh, two, um, uh, two paradigms within which we got two systems within which we could study uh, some of these questions, ask some of these questions and study them. Again, uh, with the backdrop of how the dynamical patterning modules and I'll see how, how, I'll show you how that comes in. So in case of, the, so the case two is tumor invasion. So what happens in cancer, can be, of course, interpreted in terms of mutations in particular tumor suppressors and mutations in particular, or what are called oncogenes, which give rise to um, proliferation. But there's a lot more happening in cancer over and beyond the unregulated proliferation of cells. What you're actually seeing is a loss in the organization, the loss in the architecture that I referred to. Uh, 
So of course, there is a loss in quiescence, quiescence meaning the, the state of the cell not to divide, but there is also a loss of a bunch of other things that are happening, such as this loss in adhesion. So typically this adhesion is lost. There's a loss in the ad adhesion of the cells, not just to each other, but also to their underlying milieu, which is the extracellular matrix, in this case called the basement membrane. There are also, there's a loss of specializations of the cells. The so cells no longer are shaped the way they are. They become rounded, the, a process which has been called uh, de-differentiation uh, de by pathologists. And there's of course, a loss of compartmentation. So the same idea that I talked about in terms of tissue specificity, what renders one tissue separate from the other slowly starts getting dissolved. And then you have tissues coming together. Okay, the compartmentation is lost. So in some sense, invasion or progression also is, is, the, is also acquisition, can be thought to be acquisition of a bunch of newer properties that start interacting with each other in rise to newer morphologies. So typically, again, cancer has been thought to be a very messy process um, uh, or invasion or movement of cancers are thought to be very messy processes with the chaos being depicted in some of these slides above. Uh, and, and one needs to now, again, strip this down to see that one can see pattern within these structures as well. It's a little more difficult because now we are working in three dimensions rather than two dimensions, uh, which was a, a good experimental model for the limb. In case of the three dimensions out here, the important aspect is the matrix, the extracellular matrix that surrounds the cells and which gives important cues to the cells. You can see from here, for example, what we did was we tried to recreate the, 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 the malignant uh, uh, dissemination or the malignant invasion of cancer cells uh, in, in 3D, in culture, uh, by giving them different matrices. Uh, so for example, if you were to put the cells, uh, the, the first sort of first column shows as much of reality as possible, where we have two different extracellular matrices, which are actually present with the breast. And we put both of them together in cells and we see a very messy, uh, form of invasion. You can see that the invasion ha happens from the focus outwards. Uh, in case of the second one, where we have taken out one particular extracellular matrix, you would see that the pattern happens in a different way. Although the cells are growing, but they are all connected with each other. There's a collective behavior to this cancer migration. On the other hand, if you go to the right extreme column, where there's the second matrix which has been removed, you now see a complete disintegration. Cells are completely spread out and they're completely lost. There is no sociality whatsoever. So in other words, what I'm telling you is that by tweaking specific interactions between extracellular matrix and cells, which is, a, a, by the way, a very important dynamical patterning module known as, which we call the EMT, we can actually start seeing very discrete behaviors occurring, very discrete patterns that are coming together. Uh, very similar, perhaps, if you would want to think of extending the metaphor to say the sarcopterygian and the actinopterygian, very discrete changes that occur. So fin limb transitions and so on can also be looked at as collective to dispersed transitions that are occurring out here. Okay, So uh, these experiments can also be done using time lapse. So just the way we looked at the cells moving in case of the limb development, one can also see the cells coming out of this particular focus of collection of cells into the matrix. This is actually in 3D. We have just squelched the video to show it in 2D, but you can actually see how the cells are now able to come out uh, as, the, as the tumoroid sort of expands into the matrix that surrounds it. Okay. So uh, once again, can one assign rules to them? So what we did was given the elements that are present within, within this particular structure, we brought in certain DPMs certain and, and which are those physical chemical phenomena. And we asked whether these DPMs are indeed playing an important role and can the, can the entire morphogenesis of cancer be understood through the interactions of these DPMs. So these DPMs include, of course, cellular adhesion, our first DPM, the ADH, because cell cell adhesion is crucial to the whole process. Cell extracellular matrix adhesion, which is again very important in trying to understand how um, cancers, cancer cells behave with their matrix. Reaction diffusion, because if you would, if I can show you the video slightly better, you would see that there are spaces in between how the process, how the cancer invades. You don't have an generally an en masse growth of cells. You have them occurring with 
uh, regions of depletion in the middle, which gives rise to pattern. So reaction diffusion playing a role and cell proliferation also playing a role in the whole process. Cancers after all has an important pro um, property of cellular proliferation. So these are the various DPMs that we lined up. So this time, instead of a mathematical model, we used a computational model and we put together all these DPMs, all these processes and asked, can we actually replicate what we see in experiments? First question, before building a model, can we actually calibrate the model to real world experiments and see whether the model performs to that? So by weighting the different DPMs in different ways, we were actually able to get the computer model to replicate what we were seeing in reality. We then asked the question, fine, our, then our DPMs are self-sufficient. So now we have gotten the self-sufficiency aspect to it. So our DPMs are necessary and sufficient. So these processes, in the first case, it was just reaction diffusion and adhesion. In this process, we have reaction diffusion, adhesion, matrix adhesion, cellular proliferation, and so on. Okay, so a bunch of six DPMs now. It's gotten more complex. Cancer is more complex than development. So we got the six inputs, these six DPMs, and we asked, okay, if we weight these DPMs differently with respect to each other, okay, six DPMs, what would be the outputs? How would the outputs get distributed over space? So again, we are building a morpho space out here, a phenotypic space out here. So the out here, what you have is this particular graph, which is showing about 15,000, well, no, 45,000 points. These are 45,000 phenotypes that we get as a, by combining the different DPMs in different ways. What am I doing out here? All that I'm doing here is I'm just trying to find out different patterns by which behave and interact and invade as a result of playing around with my pattern transformations. Okay. I have six pattern transforming tools. I mix them in various ways and I get 45,000 different ways by which phenotype occurs. Okay. Is there any sense to this, these 45,000 points? Can I actually make some pattern out of these 45,000 points? Are they related to each other in any way or are all of them independent with each other? So the way to understand this process is by doing what is known as clustering. So you do clustering analysis uh, and you find out which of these points are likely to be closer to with respect to each other than they are with respect to other points in the same space. Using a clustering algorithm known as k-means clustering algorithm, we found out that these 45,000 points can actually be clustered into three specific clusters. So these three class clusters are more likely to be closer to each other than they are, or points within these clusters are more likely to be closer to each other than they are to the other cluster. So if you look at these three clusters, what is the x-axis and what is the y-axis? So if you look at the x-axis, the x-axis says area of the largest cluster. The y-axis says number of dispersed objects. What we have done is we have actually played around with two output metrics. The first metric, the dispersed objects or the y-axis, talks about how many individual structures are there when a cancer invades. The x-axis talks about what is the size of the biggest cluster that forms. In some sense, I am with my x-axis trying to measure collective behavior. With my y-axis, I'm trying to understand dispersed behavior. So what I've done is that these clusters, the yellow, blue, and green, are telling me that cancers can behave roughly in three different ways or cancer invasion can behave in roughly three different ways. The blue involves very slow or no invasion. They don't invade. The yellow means that they invade in a discrete dispersed fashion. Cells just come out and that's known as mesenchymal invasion. And the green means cells invade in a particular collective way. They collect together and there's a particular sociality to these cancer cells as they invade. And if one were to start looking at individual points within these axes, one can start seeing very discrete behaviors coming out. So uh, what we have on the left side is a, a starting point or a cancer that doesn't invade. What we go, when we look up, up in the top row, we see dispersed behavior of various grades. You can see that cells are all separate. The cells are all in red and they are all, all dispersed. When we look at the bottom, we see that cells are invading, but in a collective fashion. So what are we really talking about here? What we are saying is that the DPMs, the interaction of the DPMs can give you very discrete behaviors, even in cancer, even in terms of invasion. You have specific rules that are guiding how 
a cancer invades in one particular fashion versus in another particular fashion okay so once one gets that one can then ask the question of how can one start looking at transitions of behavior from a sing single celled behavior to a multicellular behavior or a cooperative behavior to single cell behavior these are important questions that are asked by pathologists in order to try and understand how dangerous is a particular cancer and so okay so we see that tweaking certain dpms actually gives you the transformation between a collective to an individual behavior or an individual to collective behavior for example on the left hand side we measure dispersed to collective what what makes cancers go from a dispersed state to a collective state because collective state is thought to be actually more invasive than even dispersed state we see that increasing cell collagen contact energy or decreasing the adhesion between cells and the extracellular matrix actually makes the cancer non invasive so actually we one of the dpms is can be used as a therapeutic target if one is interested in those kind of pursuits on the other hand changing the diffusivity of one of the reaction diffusion parameters actually transforms them from a dispersed way to a collective uh, invasive behavior so we can actually understand the plasticity of cancers using the dynamical patterning idea concept as well so with this i come to my concluding slide so by by concluding that developmental processes as well as disease processes in case of cancer for example can be interpreted through the conceptual framework of dynamical patterning modules and it is these modules that assign discrete physico chemical roles to these molecules these molecules need not be specific specific molecules it can be a family of molecules a bunch of molecules but they typically perform specific behaviors one typically uh, does not see them doing the other behavior you although uh, non canonical functions are present one can see uh, cell adhesion molecules also playing occasional diffusive roles or transcription transcription factor roles and so on but but the typical roles in development in cancer uh, typically are 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 um, uh, are more discrete well known ones and those seem to be playing important roles in in both the dynamics of development as well as the dynamics of disease um i will end with a quote from uh, richard leventon that the, and i'll and i'll i'll quote him directly the taxonomic space of organisms has a huge number of dimensions each corresponding to some character that might be used in the characterization of an individual if one looks at the occupancy of such a space okay so harking back to our, our phyno spaces and morpho spaces and so on one is struck by the fact that it has a structure to it so the point being that when when we drew our limb development space and looked at the number of elements out there or when we drew our phenotypic space of cancers there was a specific structure to it it is not chaotic there are certain rules that guide it okay so the structure implies rules that giving rise to structure the most important thing for an evolutionist is that nearly the entire space is empty not only when extinct organisms are considered but when all organisms known to have ever existed are considered so the possibility of morpho spaces is what dick leventon is, is commenting on is endless but the occupancy is very small so where evo devo comes in is that it tries to ask why is that the structure why is there why is it that certain structures are compatible and certain structures are not compatible why are there constraints on such space explorations and our dynamical patterning framework dynamic patterning module dpm framework tries to actually explain that if you have rules you have constraints you have deterministic outcomes and one cannot have everything okay and that's why evo devo comes in development constraints and biases evolution in very interesting ways allowing for exploration of the possibilities and disallowing impossibilities so with that i will end uh, by acknowledging uh, the work done by a lot of people in 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 what i presented today uh, of course uh, stuart uh, has been um, uh, you know has been thinking about these uh, ideas since even before i started thinking about them and uh, the work done on limb development was largely in, in in his laboratory at the new york medical college in valhalla uh, tilman uh, is as a, a terrific friend and um, mathema and is extremely uh, 
um, uh, talented mathematician who's, who's, who's also able to understand the biology very well, which is very crucial to such kind of collaborative efforts. Uh, Mahul uh, helped us with the phylogenetic um, understanding of, of how galactin 8 has evolved uh, in uh, over phylogenetic time scales. Um, for the morphology of cancer, Dharma, my first uh, PhD student uh, in, in the Institute of Science, uh, performed most of these 3D experiments and has uh, worked with me to try and understand how uh, the form of cancer uh, can be interpreted. Um, and, and Durjay is an undergraduate student who performed the computational simulations in collaboration with Dharma. Mohit uh, Jolly, who's uh, an assistant professor in, in the biosystems and uh, the bioengineering department uh, in Indian Institute of Science, has also worked with us on the phenospace um, uh, and clustering aspects. So, with that, um, I would end the talk and take uh, any questions that are uh, posed to me. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for your uh, very interesting talk. Uh, there are a few questions that are coming from the students. Uh, one is from uh, Harsimran you know, from first year. The question is that, uh, is it necessary that evolution moves towards increased complexity? Um, a terrific uh, question. Uh, Simran, Evi evolution need not move towards uh, increased complexity. First of all, um, you know, I, I kind of probably uh, made the mistake of uh, talking about complexity without even defining what complexity really means. But if one can look at uh, complexities as, as, as patterns, let, let us put it, uh, you know, for the sake of argument as part of within the contours of this talk. Uh, uh, no, uh, evolution is guided by selective pressures, of course. Evolution is also guided by the, the environment. And uh, both these things are dynamic enough that one can actually move towards simpler patterns as well as more complicated patterns. Um, it, it need not be that one necessarily has a particular arrow that typically that always allows the process to evolve further and move. Think, think of it like this. Say, say I talk about the DPMs, OK? Uh, a, uh, I have three or four DPMs which are interacting with each other and giving rise to a particular pattern. Uh, what if for some reason, some, some reason, mutations or selective pressures or whatever, one of the DPMs is shut down and you start getting a pattern that is simpler. Now, is that not evolution? That is also evolution. So uh, evolution need not be guided uh, towards uh, with a particular axis, uh, which always talks about an increase. One can have dynamics of it you know i think the blind cave cave fish is, is a classical textbook example of how 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 traits have been lost if you want to talk about it in terms of traits how phenotypic traits get lost also in evolution over time and so on okay yeah another question from Upaninder that is uh, what's the role of uh, epigenetics within the mechanism of evolution Yes, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, an extremely important uh, and interesting question. Uh, the role of epigenetics uh, has to be looked at first from uh, the point of even defining what epigenetics is. Uh, it's a very controversial topic. Uh, and uh, epigenetics at one point, also, a lot of people actually, even now, I think, dismiss epigenetics as, as nonsense. So one can go from that spectrum to the other spectrum where one we talk about epigenetics as extremely specific events like you know the 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 chromatin uh, modifications and and the uh, and the promoter methylations and 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 so on. So uh, yes, uh, the the role of epigenetics. Uh, uh, so where epigenetics was originally interpreted as um, by by I think Waddington and, and subsequently was was the fact that where you can have changes that are occurring um, which do not involve the coding sequence of the protein. Something of that sort. One, one can think of it as you know, at least that, where the where the coding parts are not involved and and any other sort of more regulatory aspects are involved. So uh, it is inevitable to talk about epigenetics when one talks about say gene regulation and gene regulation involves all these different types of um, epigenetic mechanisms that are talked about by experimental biologists these days. So for example, when I talked about expression change, changes in expression of particular proteins, 
epigenetics comes in. So, you know, epigenetics is quintessential in trying to understand how protein levels say go up and go down or and, and, and so on. One, when one wants to look at how epigenetics may have uh, also molded evolution, now we talk about evolution, I was talking about developments. If you talk about evolution, uh, yes, of course, uh, the, the, the promoter sequences and, you know, when I say, when I start speaking about the conserved non-coding element that suddenly arose in a particular lineage, that is epigenetics. That is, that is where, for example, changes in the non-coding regions uh, could have also guided trajectories of evolution in different directions. So that's where epigenetics in evolution also comes in. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for uh, reading the points raised by the students. Now over to Dr. Bharti for the final words. Thank you, and uh, uh, that was uh, awesome, Ramre. And that was a wonderful update to what students have been uh, learning in terms of development through that Gilbert's developmental biology. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye.